actually today it was really the, the story was really fascinating because there was kind of a boy kind of, there was a boycott in her class um semi boycott so she wanted me to invent a story about a boycott and uh, and she specifically she told me don't make it nice i want it to be <laughs> a real conflict i want it to be harsh and uh because i try to you know i try to, to make it softer no no don't make it softer i want it so funny story. yeah and, and this was exactly after I talked with my uh, creative writing uh, students, the workshop, and I explained to them that, that part of moving from real life to a uh, story is kind of taking things to the extreme. Uh, taking something that, that happened in your life on a small scale and, and taking it and making it more dramatic. And, and like, I finished this workshop, I go to my daughter, and then she says, "Father, be more dramatic." Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it was great. Yeah, no, it's it's a great point. I I found that out when I wrote a version of a of a novel. It, actually, at the time it was more of a almost like a memoir, and I tried to write it very literal. I, I I knew the people in real life. I wanted to write them as close to the real life version as I could, and I kept getting the same response, which is that no one found it believable and they all felt like the characters were caricature and i you know i'm saying this is how they actually talk i hear them they, they couldn't believe it and only when i started to dial up the conflict and the drama to a point where it's like almost started to get out of out of hand that's when people started to buy into the story so it's a crazy thing like people the reality and this would you know when people talk about dialogue and the, the note people sometimes give about dialogue is that people don't People in real life don't talk that way. And I was speaking about this with my wife last night and I said, nobody reads a book wanting to read real life. We have real life throughout the day, 20, 23 and a half hours, and you're taking half an hour an hour for, for drama, for storytelling. Um, and that's and that dialogue, dialogue is, is a tricky thing because it has to sound like it's real life. Right, but it can't be. It can't be boring like dialogues. Right, right. It should right. be more like a, a dense version, a, a, a more uh, um, uh, accurate, accurate version of, of dialogues in, in real life. It's because if you go, to, if it sounds too uh, well written, then it's not authentic anymore. So it's kind of it's a thin line there. Uh, we'll, yes, a thin line that so I, that often breaks. Are you working on the Tel Aviv stories? What, what is happening in your life? No, um, that was that was a long time ago. And I thought um, for the 10 year anniversary to re-release it and do a new cover and maybe new, you know, edit it a bit differently. But really what's going on is I've just, I finished a novel um, that I've been working on for many years, which grew out of um, something that happened to a close friend of mine who went missing in Nicaragua in 2004, 2005, um, which actually made, when I, I was reading um, Three Floors Up, and I think Hani mentions Granada and the main street of Granada, and I'm always wondering which Granada was that? Is that Granada, Nicaragua, or is that? Granada, uh... Nicaragua, yeah. Oh, okay, so, so I found that very funny, that, uh, that parallel. So the story actually takes place at least begins in Granada because my friend went missing in Nicaragua on the island of Ometepe um, and he never came back. So I sort of, I began to write that as you know, what I was just telling you, the, the real life event, which completely didn't work. Like it really, it just did not work as a, you know, e even I, I would imagine someone like John Krakauer with um, Into the Wild, you know, I'm sure there's, a really significant degree of poetic license that he put into that book. And I didn't do that with that version that I originally wrote. So I started over, I wrote it as taking the sort of scenario as the starting point and creating a new story out of it. Um, and it's something that kind of is, 
I, I mean, I don't like to use the word literary because it feels a bit like a cop out, but it's a bit literary, but it's also a thriller. It's really got a thriller backbone to the story. Um, but I didn't want to write it as a street thriller, like, you know, when you're reading Sue Grafton or something, which I never could, I just could never read those books unless it was the best of the best of the best. Like Dashiell Hammett or something. It's like, okay, I get you. Um, and I always felt like the, the difference being that literary books tend to be more about the inter interior. Even if there's some crazy stuff going on, murder, crime, whatever, we're more concentrated on the interior and that's where the weight is placed. Mm -hmm. So that book emerged after many, 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 many years of struggle. And it's finally done for better or for worse. I don't know yet. Um, it's called In the Heart of the Jungle, at least for, for now it is. And um, so that's where I am. And, and I've, I've launched this platform, The Meaning Creators, just in parallel to the book. It's not really anything to do with that book. But because I keep finding people in my life in all sorts of little nooks and crannies, friends, not friends, strangers, people who I know from the writing like you, um, who are doing this kind of creative work that I love to do. And they're doing it for what seems to me like a similar reason, which is meaning. It gives them meaning in their life and it gives meaning to other people who are engaging with their work. And that can be novelists, it can be artists, it could be the guy who's doing his own kind of custom coffee roasting in El Yashiv nearby us here. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to, to talk to you about and, that's why, and thank you very much, first of all, for doing this, especially at this time. Um, I wanted to ask you about about you know your work and and uh, what it means to you and what you feel like it means to other people and why you do this kind of work of all the things I'm sure there are many other things you could do with your time and with your life, but you chose this one thing of of novels and storytelling and and stories in general and um, so yeah I'll kick it over to you and, and and maybe even before we go into that you can just give a little more background. Because um, I'm sure there's plenty I don't know about you as a writer. What's that? What's the general kind of timeline, or uh, the, what, what is regularly the, the length of your uh, um, pieces in, in this uh, um, project? They're short, so the, it comes out as a, I do this as text. I, I transcribe and then I do as text, and it's it's really short. It's like um, you know a thousand words or less uh -huh. you know, of, of interviews okay. so um okay. Not, yeah okay so I'll, I'll try to be uh focused i, I think I, I will begin with the time that we, we are living in the, you know the, the, the pandemic time the corona time uh for me was very very meaningful uh i i all the things that i do in life regularly suddenly they had more meaning in a way. Uh, I, and I will begin not, not with, with, with writing, even though I wrote a lot during this time, but with teaching. I'm, I'm, I'm a creative writing teacher. And the minute the, um, the, the, the country went into a lockdown, we decided to move all our workshops to uh, Zoom. Now, it was, it was not a clear-cut decision. We could have just shut down school. We could have done it and, and, and fire everybody like you know, many, many other firms in Israel did. But we had a conversation. I'm, I'm doing this uh, writing workshop uh, uh, school uh, with, with a partner. Uh, she's a poet, uh, Ovid Vidali. So we had a late-night conversation after the Netanyahu's uh, press conference. And she said, let's do it, let's, we, let's do it because it's new, because we never did it, and because it's, it's, it's proactive. It's not surrendering to reality, but let's, let's, let's fight about it. And my, our estimation was that about 30 or 40% of the students would, would refuse and, and ask their money back. So this is what we took into consideration. And then she developed this kind of special method of teaching online and taught our teachers how to do it. Eventually, out of 200 students, we got only uh, three people left. All the other remained. Wow. Which is amazing. That's and then, and, and talking about meaning, and, 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 and here's my confession. My confession is I don't like teaching on Zoom. 
it, it, it's there's no uh, milk of human kindness you know there's no this kind of the, a, a feeling that you get of a room of you or the nuances and 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 you don't get back from the class as you get with the but I must say that I never felt as meaningful in what I do as I felt in, in these two months because you begin the workshop and you see 15 people that are generally speaking down down depressed anxious and troubled they eat pale they had too much time with their family too much time alone and they're, they're about to get crazy and and you see you see it in their faces and then class begins and you give them exercises and you give them energy and slowly slowly they give you energy back and, and, and amazingly enough they become a group uh, we had a group on Tuesdays which which started with, with one real workshop and then we switched to zoom I don't know how it happened but they became a real group now they are communicating with each other next week we are going to do our first uh, physical meeting after a uh, real meeting after after two months of recess and we finished every class and, and telling to each other that was extremely important for them even maybe we had less fun but you can see how writing of giving people the opportunity to write it during this time, the opportunity to be creative, the opportunity to be um, to connect to themselves, to connect to their imagination. How meaningful it was for them! They they thanked us in ways that we were never thanked before. Mm -hmm. So 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 this was this was one aspect of this um, uh, this time, and then writing and and publishing stories. Uh, when the pandemic began, I did a special project with, uh, you know, uh, have you heard of Ivrit? Uh, it's the ebook, the ebook publisher, the, the ebook publisher in Israel. Right? Mm -hmm. you, you, okay, no, I they, haven't heard they, of them. They take books and they, they make them to ebooks and they also publish their own stuff. And, and mm -hmm. usually the ebook market in Israel is about seven or eight percent, but the, the bookstores were closed. Right. And then they, they asked me if I, I, I want to do something with them uh, commercially. And I said, let's do it for free. I, I would give three stories of mine. And you, you would give them for free. And you would just give them as a gift to the readers. And, and we did it. I, I took three short stories that I had. One of them is, is about uh, a plague of empathy. Uh, that, uh, a story I wrote after visiting in uh, Panama. I'm a, a Latin American freak. So uh, I've been to Nicaragua and I've been to Panama and I, I wrote a story about plague of empathy. And, and two, sto two other stories that are basically about love and, and relationships. And, and we gave them for free. And then wow. I, I think now it's, we're talking about 20,000 people, which in Israel is a lot. For just three stories, they they downloaded it, and I got you know responses from, from people saying we are in the lockdown and you we're reading your stories, which are I specifically picked three uh, of the uh, positive kind of good vibes story because people are already depressed. So so I gave it uh, and, that, and and I felt meaningful. And then the last thing I did was. Um, um, Publishing a short story called Lemonade, and it's about it's 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 another form of feeling meaningful is doing like um, being able to express your concerns about society, not only about yourself or about relationship. And one of the the phenomena now in Israel is is the, is the economical situation. Of specifically of artists and, and independent people. So I wrote this short story about a couple who are they're both fired. And then uh, we have, I don't know if you know this, we have in, in Israel, we have this saying of make, making lemonade out of the lemons. 
you know this uh, cliche? Yeah, yeah. It, Take well, the demo to the moon. Sure. Yeah. So, so, so the guy, the husband, is walking in the house all the time and saying, "We have to make lemonade out of the lemons." We have, we have, he has all these crazy ideas, like startup nation ideas. Like, let's do a an app of of a virtual hugs. Let's do a a course of acting in front of a Zoom, eh? and and it all fails. And and in the end, the wife has to has to make a very dramatic uh, decision uh, in a way to sell herself. Uh, in order to, 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 to maintain the economical situation or to, to, to cope with it. Uh, I don't want to ruin the story, but I can send it to you. Uh, it's it's sure. already translated to English. Yeah, it's never it's great. Yeah, thank you. And it was published in Haaretz, and it was published later on in Italy, in Romania, and now uh, Spain is, is coming in, and, and maybe the United States later. Uh, I hope so. But it was a story about what is happening, about this, this, this stress of or the economical stress and, and about the effect of the pandemic on, on you know, the, 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 the couple and, uh, and, and how do you cope with it. And so this was also a way of feeling meaningful. I'm reacting to the situation. Mm -hmm. What was really amazing, I can also send it to you, um, because all the actors are, are unemployed, and the directors, so and the writers, which which are writing for theater or, or cinema, yeah. uh, there was this kind of uh, group who, who decided to do a big show on Zoom. They called it "The Show Must Go Home," <laughs> and and I, they they read the story and they and they said we want to do an adaptation to Zoom to, of, of this story. And they took the best actors in Israel and one of the best directors, and, and, and it was already on uh, a week ago. Wow! It's on YouTube, and, it's, wow. and it, 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 it was even more extreme than my story in, in the sense that when you see it, when you see uh, a couple in such a crisis, economic crisis, you can't. It really touches you. I was touched by by my own adaptation. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, that was a lot of things to do, uh, and it, it, was, it was like taking to ex to the extreme things that I I, I usually feel them on. You know, if you're talking about the the word the font, you know that you have the size 12, mm -hmm. 14. Usually, I feel these feelings of meaning in teaching. I feel them on font 12, font 14, but. In this time, I felt it really intense, really intense. And what I do is important for other people. And, and it kind of brought me back to writing in a very energetic way. Mm -hmm. It was a long speech. Sorry. No, it's, it's a good one. But I, I think what's really interesting about a lot of it is that you're touching on things that I, I feel like these changes have been working their way to their surface over the last... 10, 20 years, and the core of the change is not the technology. It's that the, the, this ability for us to be connected to one another at any moment has made, has changed the dynamic of, of um, almost the relationship between the creative act and the meaningful act and how we understand compensation. And there's been a shift where free is now almost more valuable than money because you do something for free and you give a gift in that way. And the spread of that network makes that thing that you've created a hundred or a thousand times more valuable than if you taken the, you know, the, the 20 shekel, the 30 shekel for it in the first place. So mm -hmm. it's a, I think what, what it is is that we're seeing this relationship between generosity and creativity. That's probably always been there, but I think, you know, the consumer culture and capitalist culture that we live in has suppressed it. And now it's coming back up. Because when I think about the 15 people who are in your class, you know, my mind thinks, who are they? And what are they gonna do? They're gonna be writers. And I fear for them. I fear for their, their futures. Um, like I fear for my future as a writer. But then I think it's something beyond the, um, the financial, something that's about that deeper connection to who they are as, as human beings. 
And when you have that thing, you are intact. You can live a life intact. And when you are making however much money you are making or not making, but you feel as if you're living a lie, you cannot be attacked. You, you become toxic. Um, so that, that's why I feel like is it, you know, you're, you've connected into a lot of these things and you as a writer with a lot of experience have the ability, the skills, the relationships to grab this opportunity right now, which just seems like it is what you've been, what you, what you are doing in, in many ways. So it's great to hear. It's great to hear that there is some light at this, in this dark tunnel. It's, it's, uh, I think one of the lectures we gave for free was uh, in, in our school. And, 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 and again, it was amazing to see how many people wanted to listen. Uh, it was a lecture of an editor in uh, the biggest publishing house in Israel. And people, people asked her about this, about like, it's really hard to be a writer and it's really hard to get published now. The industry is not, not in a good time. And she said, Writing is, is you know, people write because th this is the way of understanding their own life. This is how they can understand life. It's not about being published. And I, I don't teach people in order to make them writers. I teach people creative writing because I think it, it makes them better people. And if they are in a group and they are attentive to each other, then maybe they also can be you know, saved in the way of, uh, of learning how to be um, less egocentric and more graceful to other people. And if we're talking about the Israeli society, if you put in the same room, you have uh, Orthodox Jews and, and an Arab and, uh, and young people, old people, rich, poor, in the same room writing, then you, you can also bridge the gap between uh, the abyss sometimes, between the tribes of the Israeli society. So you have also the, the social meaning. That it's kind of, uh, th th that's the way to bridge. If people are, have something in common, then politics is aside and then they're writing together and they're less judgmental. So, so this is why I teach creative writing. I, I, I love it when my students have you no know, success. I, I even have one star, she's, she's even, I think in the States, she's, she's quite successful. Her name is Ayelet Gunda Goshen. Mm. She's selling hundreds of thousands of copies. Yeah, she. What was the name of her book? The most recent book. Uh, Waking Lions. Uh, she has Waking Lions and maybe also uh, The Liar, and she's mm -hmm. she, she's a star and she's a huge star in Germany. Also, moves very well in the United States. Yeah, she twice. she used to live in the U.S. or in Canada or something. Is that part no, of her story? No, no, she okay, has very English, but she, no. And I, I, of course, I'm very proud of her, and I'm bragging. She's my student, but she's not the reason I'm teaching. I'm teaching for, you know, uh, to, to bring people closer to themselves and to each other. That's the, the, the reason why. So we, we started with the present. So let's go a little bit back to the past. How did you get into this vocation, occupation, calling, whatever it is in the first place as a, as a writer, storyteller? You know, I saw a documentary about uh, Robin Williams. The, the actor mm -hmm. uh, following his um, his path, the dots in his life uh, till his tragic end, and I realized that he is responsible to my life force because mm -hmm. I, there are two movies with Robin Williams that when I saw them, I I, I said to myself, "This is what I want to do." The first one was uh, Dead Poet Society. You know this movie? Yeah, of course. Amazing. Amazing. Literature, literature teacher in a boarding school. And, yeah. and, and you know, I saw this movie when I was 16. I said, I want to be a teacher. This is what I want to do. And, and you know, eventually I got to be a teacher. That's a right? very central part of my life right now. I, I help other people to teach also. And then there was other, the other movie was The World According to God. Which is adaptation. Irving. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. John Irving. And in the, in the world according to God, he's an aspiring writer. His mother is a big uh, nonfiction writer, and he's just begin, a beginner. He writes short stories in his typing machine. And again, I think he's responsible because it looked like a wonderful life. He's writing story. His wife is out, you know, uh, 
of teaching and he he's welcoming the children when they come back home he's, all, all the time he's like a little child in a way it seems like if you are a writer you can maintain the child in your sleep inside which is kind of true so it's it all happened because of Robin Williams I had these two uh, two uh, visions about my future I must say that being a teacher was much more clear to me at the age of mm-hmm. 16. Being a writer in Israel, where I grew up in Haifa and Jerusalem, nobody really called it a profession. Nobody really talked about it as something that you could do in life. Hmm. So kind of it was like being a teacher like Robin Williams seemed like a more reasonable thing to, to aspire to than being a writer like Robin Williams. Mm-hmm. So, so So it took time. I think it took me at least 10 years from, from the moment I started thinking about writing and being a writer and telling stories till I actually went to a writing a workshop. This was the, the real key moment. Um, actually, there was one before because you like you, you, you also went to Latin America besides writing a story about it. Um, well, uh, I grew up in San Diego, California, okay. so on the border of Mexico. So Mexico was always part of life. Um, but I traveled in Nicaragua and Costa Rica and Honduras a little bit for six months or something like that. That's a lot. Yeah, it was a, it was a lot, and a lot can happen in Latin America in six months and did. Um, but yeah, I, I also, I loved it when I, it's a, it's a, I find it very raw, ex, rough, exposed, beautiful, all those things together. Cause you know, it, especially in Nicaragua where I was, cause Nicaragua is not, it's not as developed in terms of, at least at that, at that time, 10, 15 years ago, it was not as developed. I was getting robbed left, right and center. We've got swine flu. All these things are happening and it's also beautiful, but. But anyways, continue, sorry. Well, I, I, because I, I, I think where the, by writing uh, really began in, in, in South America, because mm. I, I was backpacking yeah. and I had a girlfriend, uh, which later became my wife, she's uh, upstairs now. And, and I, I wanted to write her letters, I'm talking about 1994. Had mm-hmm. real letters, not even. And the, the idea was that if I would write her enough letters, then we, it, we would be able to maintain the relationship. Because it was a long time, and she was a very attractive girl, is. And, and I thought, I have to find a way to, to, to make it alive, in a way, to keep it alive, even if I'm traveling with a friend. And, So I was writing her a lot, a lot. And then if, if you've been to, to Latin America, you know that sometimes nothing happens. Nothing happens. Like you wait two days for a bus. And so, but I had to write these letters. So I started inventing things. Like I would, sometimes I would tell her, you know, uh, now it's the fiction part of the letter. And sometimes, you know, just switch into fiction, uh, mm, move wow. into fiction without telling her. And, I, and this, I think this was the moment that I realized that I enjoy fiction more than, than the non-fiction. I enjoy lying. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, so I kind of came back from the, from the big uh, backpacking trip in South America with, with a decision that I want to write a book. I was 24, 25, and it didn't work out. I, I had this huge computer and I tried writing stories and nothing came out. And it took a while. I, I had to go to a writing workshop, and then later on, I started developing my stories. So, the, you know, I, I think that's a point where absolutely every writer, every creative person, every person in general gets to that wall. They hit the wall. They want to do the thing, the dream. They try. It doesn't work. And then that's a kind of a fork. And... I think a lot of people go down the road of saying, tried, didn't work, 
onto the thing that I'd never really wanted to do, but I'm going to just do it anyway. But then some people can say, and it's not that you make this decision once, you make it over and over and over, but to decide, I'm going to try it again. And I'm going to try it. You know, it's like that famous um, Beckett, Samuel Beckett quote of ever, ever tried, ever failed, try again, mm -hmm. fail again, fail better. Mm -hmm. What was it that, that got you back to do it again and to try a different way? Um, it was, I, I, I was not defining it in terms of doing it, uh, of success, of doing it um, successfully. I just wanted to lie. Just there was something inside of me that wanted, to, needed to be expressed. And it was since I was a child, I was looking for ways. If you, if you ask my mother, she 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 could tell you that I tried to be a musician. I tried to be a painter. I tried. I even went to study acting, theater when I was uh, uh, before the army. So I, I was I was looking all the time to. Some, some kind of channel to express. So it was not about, I, when I went to the workshop, it was not in order to be a, a writer or a publisher, but I just wanted to write, to, to let it out. And, and when I sent my, my first manuscript to the publishing houses, the answer was no, for, for quite a while. It, it took, I got 10 no's before my first yes, and the 10 no's were, were Two and a half a year and month, nine months. So, and, and, and then, and, and again, if you ask me what kept me going after when, when I got all these no's, it's not, just, I didn't feel like amazingly self confident or something. I just felt I want to let it out. I wrote something, I want to let it out. Um, but you get stuck in all sorts of walls, you get, you get the writer's block. Uh, you get uh, you get sometimes you get feedback that uh, really shakes you. And you don't know what to mm -hmm. what to do with it. Yeah. I just gave my new uh, manuscript to uh, my editor, and there are three. It's made out of three parts, and one of the parts she completely kind of disapproved, disagreed with the basic elements of this of the, the plot. <laughs> and and I, I, I don't know what to do because I, I think I'm right. And now my wife has to meet it. And she has to tell me that I'm right. That's but, what's going to, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I hope so. Give it to the so. wife. Yeah. <laughs> but but sometimes, yeah, sometimes you get confused from, uh, from feedbacks you get and reactions. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of hurdles, you say, like hurdles mm. in, in the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some books are, are like three floors up. Was, easy in a way it, it just wrote itself um a, a book before was more like was much more problematic uh it was it's, it, neuland was a struggle mm -hmm. that, that of eight years of drafts so wow. you can never know uh, it's it's in, it's a new challenge every time i think i'm less intimidated now but when i face a block I know that if if I can't solve it, I can go the other way. I can I can write something else. I can write a short story, a poem, a script. I think uh, this is what I try to do when I when I have a, a writer's block or, or a creative mm -hmm. block. Is try and do something else. Mm -hmm. In that sense, I'm not orthodox. I'm not only a novel. Uh, a writer of novels. I do, I do short stories. I do scripts. I do theater. I do. I, I write. I work with musicians a lot. Uh, so this is my kind of solution. Yeah, and I think that's also what back to what we were saying earlier about this change in in society and the way that we are able to connect with others is that you don't you don't have to depend on a gatekeeper anymore for other people to consume your work. So, and that I think is devastating for a lot of people where they write something and they, they don't, they're not looking for a prize. They're not looking for money. They're just looking for the connection. That's it. But at the time where the gatekeepers could say, no, 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 no. That would be, I think, a, enough for a lot of people to say, I can't. It's just, I can't even get the minimal connection. And now you don't need that. You can press the button and connect. You can publish the story on Facebook. You can publish it wherever you want. You can publish your own book if you want. And I think I, I've noticed it for myself 
is that I, at some point I had this goal of writing 10 short stories. It's just practice and learning and each time I'd said, I'm gonna write the story and I'm gonna pitch it to the magazines, the journals or whatever. And it became such a high stakes exercise because there was this notion of approval and disapproval and success and failure that I only wrote two. And more recently when I said, you know what, I, screw it, I'm just gonna write them and publish them, write them, publish them. I've written 12. And each one of them is so much fun. It's just such mm. a great, it's like a little spark, you know, a little spark in the darkness. And if it, if it catches a fire, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The spark was there. I saw it, I felt it. And I, I, so I think that's a part of where we are today, um, globally, socially, culturally, is that people can, can feel free to create because maybe their their 10 friends will be able to read it or 100 people it doesn't matter yeah. and that's a that's a major shift i think we're we're seeing and especially today with coronavirus like you're saying it's that it, it's accelerated that 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 transformation the minute i'm opening i'm opening the door to my adolescent just a sure. no problem adolescent my adolescent girl Hello. You know, you know what's the, the best thing that happened to, happen to me create, creatively, uh, creative wise. After uh, I published a book in Israel called The Last Interview, that's going to be published in, uh, in the States in October, I think, in November. And usually, after I publish a book, I am completely uh, devastated. I can't do anything creative, I, I'm, I'm empty. I'm, I'm exhausted from public uh, from publicity. And, and then I got an, an email from um, the editor of Vanity Fair Italy. Mm. Uh, I didn't know, but the, the Italian branch of Vanity, Vanity Fair is a big one. So they, they have many uh, subscribers and a website. And, and he said, we want to offer you a project. And the project is to ev every week you would write a short story. Uh, he said 500, he said uh, six, uh, 650, 700, uh, 700 words. Uh, later on, I understood that uh, he meant in Italian and in Hebrew it's 450. And it would be called the Dictionary of, um, of Desire, Diccionario de Desiderio. And every week it will be according to a, a word in Italian, the, the A, B, C of, of Italian, like amore, baci, confessione, desideri. We will send you a list of words in, in the letter uh, that begins with the letter and you would choose one word and you would write a story about it. And like, I was just about to answer him, I don't do these kind of things, which, because I don't, but then I thought, well, fuck, I, 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 don't, I, I, I can't do anything else, and it pays well, and it sounds kind of strange, but I don't know, my publisher in Italy, they say it's, it's, it's an important magazine, and, so, and it's also it sounds fun. Let's try, and it's, so I said I'm going to try, and then it ended up with a column that we ran from A to Z, and then it was it's so much fun, and the, the, the column was a big success. Then we started again from A to Z, uh, with uh, names of places, ge ge geography. It was called Geography of Emotions. So by the end of the year, I had fifty, about fifty short stories. Wow! Not not all of them were good, I must say, because the the, the whole I, deadline idea, the, like writing a story in a week, uh, even if you have it, like prepare some in advance, it's still kind of stressful. Yeah. So I would say out of 50, I have between 20 and 25 stories, which are, which are good. Wow. Short stories, really short. And, and as you said, because it was in Italian, published in Italy, and who, you know, who knows besides the, besides the Italian, I could publish or write about anything I wanted without uh, taking into consideration how does my family feel about it, <laughs> uh, what would people say, and I, I just, it was just, you know, for fun, uh, very quick also, I wrote it, 
I had a secret advisor in Israel. She read it. She gave me remarks. I, I, I changed it a little bit, sent it to translator, published. Mm -hmm. And it kind of brought back the, the joy of, you know, just for fun. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. like an exercise. And, it was, and, and, and now, um, in the end of May, there's going to be only in Italy, for now, not in Israel, not in other countries that publish my book. We're going to do a book out of these stories. Like it's going to be a, a book uh, of, of short stories. And, Amazing. And it started, it's, I, I, I was just about to say no. Really, it was that close. Maybe in another hour of the day, a little bit you know, more pissed off, because of something, I would have just said, no, I don't do these kind of things. And because of, I, you know, I just said yes. And, uh, I think it's, um, it, it's the idea, partly, it sounds like, the idea of play. You know, there's got to be a sense of play. Otherwise, it just, and I feel this with the book I've just finished, there's, there was no sense of play. It was mm -hmm. just agony all the way through, which makes me nervous, because can an agonized book really be enjoyable to a reader? I don't know. But um, the reader, uh, the reader can. The reader doesn't doesn't know what what when was. I hope not. I hope I, I hope it's all under the under the surface. But um, but yeah. I feel yeah. I hope it doesn't. I hope that doesn't come through. But the 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 sense of play with these stories and and um, and to see th that sometimes the little spark does catch. So it catches someone else, it catches a person where they say, wow. And you know, the, their, the way they caught that story was so different from anything that I'd have thought about it, which, you know, and that of course happens with all kinds of creativity. Um, but it's a great thing to experience because you see this thing has a little bit of a life of its own. Um, oh, it's really hard to maintain the playfulness, to maintain playfulness in writing a novel you have been working on for years, it's really, uh, it's like a mental, it's like a, um, how do you say, like a spin doctor, you know, the spin doctors of, mm. of the politics, you have mm -hmm. to be your own spin doctor, you have to right. work in a way to, to trick yourself in order to convince yourself that this is fresh, <laughs> like, how can I be fresh with this book I've been working on for eight years, like, yeah. like Michael Neuland. Yeah. I tried everything. I tried, I tried even give you, letting the, the characters send emails to each other and writing only their emails for three months just to get this kind of freshness again. Uh, it's, I, it's, I'm, I'm just I looking on my shelf because it's somewhere on the shelf over there in Neuland. It's, 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 psych, it's really a psychological... Uh, challenge to, to maintain the, the sense of playfulness in writing a novel wow really tough yeah i think it's um trying to be a little bit dis dispassionate a little bit detached um a, and a little I, I heard someone say at some point that part of writing is understanding that the thing you're doing is is the most important thing that you as an individual can do and also embracing this idea at the same time that it is completely has no bearing or no significance on anything and it really doesn't mean anything, so don't worry about it. You've got to maintain those yeah. ideas at the same time and that's really, that's a hard thing to do because you get caught up in it and you know, I feel myself, I have, I have little kids, two, two and one, and I come downstairs with all this heaviness of the book and I look at them and I'm like, they, they don't have anything to do with this heaviness. They are little, you know, little pixies and they don't need that. They don't need the bullshit. So let it be bullshit in my office and downstairs with the kids. It can be just daddy. I just had a, had a conversation with a friend who is also a writer. And uh, he told me he's really worried about uh, publishing his new book because it's very uh, um, personal and uh, exposing uh, for him. And it was funny because I, I it's, uh, we had the same conversation, but in, in, in different roles. Uh, when I was about to publish the last interview, and, and I just, we sat down yesterday and I quoted the same thing he said to me. I said, do you remember what you told me two years ago? You told me this, you told me, you think that this is, your book would be in, like that important? No, it's not. 
It's not. It's, it's right. you, people would not be really interested what happened or what didn't happen in your, your real life. They have their own life that they will, you know, and they will they will read it. They, maybe it will be even meaningful for them, but but it's not important. It's not the, the central thing in their life. So 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 relax, man. That's what he told me two two years ago, and I just you know mirrored the same thing. He said, "Yeah, it's it's if you if you're writing about." real stuff and it's i understand it's hard for you but don't don't panic because in the end it's literature it's not um yeah 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 i think it's funny because it goes both ways i think on the one hand there's that phenomenon where people just you think it's gonna create an earthquake and then it's barely a squeak and on the other hand you read these books you know that have had a profound effect and creating scandal or Oscar Wilde going to prison. I mean, it wasn't just for his books, but, um, you know, it's, it's the unpredictability, I think, is that you just don't know. And that's all, that's in all things in life. We don't know the outcome. We don't know. Maybe, maybe, and I've, I've had the, I've had the same fear with this book because it's, as I mentioned before, it was kind of connected to my friend's disappearance. And I'm thinking to myself, God forbid I should, my friend, died there in Nicaragua and God forbid this book should offend his parents who have lost a child. God forbid I should write something like that. And it's plagued my mind for, you know, and I thought maybe I just throw this thing away. So I don't, I don't commit that sin. But then on the other hand, I think this is not a book about him. It's a different story and I'm not intending to hurt anybody. And I don't really actually know. I don't actually know what that outcome might be. And I have to just let it go. And that's, I think, another outcome from the coronavirus is that we all have to understand we don't know what's going to happen. And we never did. It was an illusion. Even before the corona, we didn't know what the next day was going to bring. We have to be uncomfortable in that uncertainty. And that's what I think writers, you learn. And, you know, the question I was asking you before, how do you choose to go on when it seems like there's a wall in front of you? And I think the answer is partly to say, it's uncertainty and it's just be comfortable in that place of uncertainty. Learn to play in the uncertainty. And I think if you can do that as a creative person, no matter what it is you're doing, you're going to be fulfilled by that, by that joy of creating in the uncertainty. There is, a, there is, there is even, I think, a, um, a definition for that, for what we were talking about. It's uh, like tolerance to ambiguity. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think in my psychology studies, there was a piece, part about creativity and what, what does it demand from you and tolerance to ambiguity is, is one of the things and right. many, many, many times even, even no, no, I'm not solving it, it's right now, it's going to be solved right. by my subconscious, I'm going to dream right. about it, right. maybe later, even, you know, even if we have, um, Sometimes discussions at our, at our school and, and, and trying to be creative and invent new stuff. And sometimes at one point I can say, I'm the manager. So I can say, okay, we're not going to solve it now because we don't have a good, good enough solution. It's not yet creative enough. And yeah. okay, let's, let's sleep on it, talk tomorrow. Yeah. And, and, and people, most of the people, they want the, the sense of, of secure, of, yeah, yeah. Like we have the decision. And sometimes it's, uh, it's it's okay to say yeah we're, we're taking our time this is this is i think patience is extremely important for yeah. for life it's yeah. just fixed it's it, it is the hardest thing it really is but okay. um but it's also the most how old, how old are you i am 38 mm, okay oh it's, yeah. a, it's a good, good age for a writer yeah, it, yeah, it is. It is. It is what it is. It's it's better than it was at twenty eight, that's yeah. for sure. But um, but yeah, I don't. I don't know. And and every day, I every day, that's my battle. That's my struggle. My struggle is not with the words or the story or the whatever. My struggle is always about what's going to happen. How is this going to work? How is this going to work out? Who am I going to be? And it's that's the hardest battle. But um, but we learn, you know, you learn how to fight smarter. You learn how to not fight. That's the best thing. Learn yeah. to be at peace. 
But um, just out of curiosity, where do you live? Ranana. Uh, okay. Ranana is a suburb of Tel Aviv. Yeah, I live in I live in Kfaryona, which is not too far. Oh, Moshe. Yeah. Neighbors. Kalab. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, well, the answer right now is just it's late and it's tired and my Hebrew will 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 be <laughs> way worse than your English. Um, but um, for the interview series, I, I do sometimes do these interviews in Hebrew, but I, I, I just have a sense, I think, from reading interviews of, of you in English that, you know, yeah, you would be uh, you would do a better job in English than I would in Hebrew. So okay, so, so the real question is, what are you doing in Faryona writing in English? How did that How did that happen? So that's the question I ask every day as well. Yeah. Um, how did that happen? It happened. Um, it happened that um, I, I've been in. I've lived in Israel for a long time, fifteen years, um, on and off sometimes, but. Um, we lived in Tel Aviv. I, I lived in Tel Aviv for, for 13, 12, 13 years. And um, got married, had kids, wanted a house, space, garden, et cetera. And I felt like I almost outgrew Tel Aviv because it's small. People, you know, you read about Tel Aviv and I'm sure you know it very well, but it's, it's really, really small. And when you come, I lived in New York and I went to blah, 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 blah. And you, you just kind of like, where's the rest of it? And it was a choice between putting ourselves in a small apartment in a small city for a lot of money or finding a house where we can have, a, you know, my house looks onto these beautiful uh, yeah. cultural fields and there's a view and the air is nice and the kids are happy. And so that, but we, we had my wife's English. She grew up in London mm. and pretty much there's not a week we go by that goes by where we don't say, are we really, are we going to stay here? Is this what we're doing? not to go to New York and not to go to London, but at the end of the day, we just don't want to live the, the, that kind of life that there is in London, New York, or wherever. Just, we did it, we were there, and it, it, there's a lot about it that's great and amazing and the culture and all that stuff, but this is our home and uh, this is our children's home, so. Mm -hmm. So that's well, what. I think Israel is a very good place to live in, but it's not easy to be a writer in English, living yeah. uh, in a Hebrew-speaking country. It's really yes, it's not easy. Tough. Yeah, and you know, I, I really do debate career-wise. Uh, I try to answer all these questions, but then I, I come back to what I was just talking about before. It's like I couldn't uproot our lives and go to New York, and there might not be any benefit career-wise. I don't know. Maybe the career benefited. Is he, I don't know anything. All I can say is, this is good for us. This is a great place. You know, the, for me, the best thing about Israel is the people. It's, you know, that this is what, in a certain way, it's, it's kind of like the people in, in uh, the private sphere, when you're not dealing in an official capacity or on the roads or something, when you're dealing on a human to human basis, the people are the best thing about Israel. And you can't get that abroad. You know, you can't import that when you're abroad. So, so we, we stay here and, and we love it. And sometimes we, don't love it, but uh, mostly we do. Beautiful. Yeah. So but, uh, uh, I, I think I, I like in a couple of minutes I have to finish. Anything sure. else you want to add? No, no. Uh, this is this has been great. I think if you have, um, I like to put as many images as I can. So if you have any, if a headshot would be great for the sort of the cover, and then anything else, even covers of books would be great. Um, if you want, I can grab them off the web or something. But um, I can I can uh, get you connected with. Uh, I don't have anything personally, but uh, I have to get get you connected with uh, the publicist of the publishing house and just say and you know cool. I share this project and he would give you covers and and shots and whatever you need. Great. And I'll send you the lemonade story so you can enjoy the. Sababa, so, thank you. That's my, great. My uh, my lockdown story. I'm looking forward to it. So uh, thank you very, very much for, for this. I uh, really appreciate uh, yeah, it. Don't, don't, be, don't be a stranger. If you're in Kfaryona, then go to a place, a place, a place. A place, a place, a place. How do I stay connected to what's going on? The, is there a Facebook page? Or? I, I, I mentioned that I'm going to share with you. I don't have any Facebook. Oh. 
אבל יש לי, דווקא היה לי אירוע בכפר יונה ממש לפני הקורונה. היה לי, היה לי קונצרט ודה מיוזישן בכפר יונה, בספרייה, היה ממש מגניב. וואו. אני אעדכן אותך שיהיה משהו. איך לא ידעתי. אני זוכר שהיית באבן יונה שם, בקניון, לפני הרבה זמן, כמה שנים כבר. כן, ופספסתי אותך שם. לא, לא, ממש עכשיו, ממש כאילו עשיתי מופע עם איזה פורק סינגל כזה, אבל בסדר, יהיה עוד, עוד מעט זה הכל חוזר. טוב, אז אני אהיה בקשר, עד יהיו צ'קים. בהצלחה עם הספר הזה. מה? בהצלחה, good luck to the project. Thank you very, very much. Oh, the last thing I didn't tell you, my, 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 you know, in, in America we have a Hebrew name. My Hebrew name is Eshkol. Dai. That's, yeah. Dai. So when I go to... Wait, 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 בבית הכנסת קוראים לי אשכול. גם כאילו כתוב לי במושב שלי, כאילו, אשכול. I've asked my parents this a thousand times, and they say it was the, we lived in Philadelphia, and the rabbi in the synagogue chose that name. I don't know why, you know, and... Yeah, people, when I say Eshkol, sometimes they're, look, they're kind of like, in Hebrew, I'm like, what's your name, Eshkol? And they're like, what, Eshkol? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's only in Bet Knesset that anyone would ever call me that, my friends would never know. Actually, the Eshkol has at least a few... Something, yeah, but it could have been, yeah, Ash, could have been Asher, it could have Ash- been Ashri, it could have been so many other things, but... Uh, oh, but Eshkol is a very good choice. I, no, I, honestly, I think it's an amazing name. What, I've looked into it, and I've kind of, you know, from in Torah and, and the meaning behind the name, and I think it's an incredible name. And I don't think of it as my name. I, it's, it's kind of something different for me. But, but yeah, I've, so when, when I first, first, first heard about you, I'm like, wow, this guy's name is Eshko, and he's a writer. <laughs> 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 oh, yalla. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.